We welcome you to the online ministry of Park Street Baptist Church of Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. The message was preached on the date indicated. The music was recorded previously. May God bless you as you join us in worship and in the study of God's Word. We've been studying the birth of John. This is the John who would become known as John the Baptist or John the Baptizer because of his ministry. This is not Jesus' disciple John who wrote the Gospel of John and the letters of John and the book of Revelation. The angel Gabriel had announced John's birth but Zachariah the priest had questioned how his wife 
could give birth to their firstborn son since they were physically too old to have children. And so the angel had given him a sign. He would become mute. After Zechariah returned home, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant. She kept away from other people for five months, and then she received a visit from her cousin Mary. Mary visited to tell her that she too was carrying a miracle baby, and she would give birth to the Messiah, the baby Jesus. During the Christmas season, we spent time thinking about the angel's visit to Mary and Mary's visit with Elizabeth. And for that reason, we'll leave out that portion of chapter 1. However, we do need a brief reminder of what happened when Mary first arrived and greeted Elizabeth. And when, Mary, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. I thought I would look up this Greek word to see the range of meaning thus translated here by leaped. One meaning was to jump or spring about exuberantly. Think of little boys or girls in the backyard playing. Another meaning was to skip about playfully, like a lamb. And the third meaning is this one, the movement of a baby within the womb. And I found it interesting that in Bible times this movement was taken as a sign of joy. Now it's possible this movement of the baby within Elizabeth was unusually strong, but the exact timing was very significant. Remember that the unborn John would become the messenger who preceded Jesus, the Messiah. Mary had conceived the baby Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit shortly before her visit with Elizabeth. And Elizabeth realized that her unborn son was moving for joy at meeting the mother of the unborn Messiah. God was making a point to these women that Mary's child was the Messiah whom Elizabeth's child would announce. And so at that moment, Elizabeth, then over five months pregnant, was filled with the Holy Spirit herself and blessed Mary and the baby Jesus. Let's skip ahead now several months after Mary had gone home. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. We saw previously that Elizabeth had felt sorrow over the fact that she had no children. And it was probably some of these very neighbors and relatives who had made her feel badly. But now they rejoiced with her. The birth of a baby is always special. But given that she had waited so long, they knew this baby was a miracle. And we're told that they recognized that the Lord had shown great mercy to her. They realized that this was a miracle. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zachariah after his father. But his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. When John was circumcised, he was then marked as a Jew, as one of God's people. And this was the time to officially name him as well. The neighbors and relatives fully expected him to be named after his father. But Elizabeth spoke for Zechariah and refused. She said his name was John. Well, that made no sense to those who had come for the celebration. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke, blessing God. Now, I'm sure that Elizabeth had already told them that this was Zachariah's wishes, but they wanted to hear it from Zachariah himself. He couldn't talk, so they made signs to him. Does that strike you as odd? The angel hadn't said that he would be deaf as well. 
So I wonder if on hearing that Zachariah was mute, some of them just assumed he was deaf. In any case, they made signs. And he must have made signs back to ask for a tablet. And on the tablet he wrote, his name is John. Now imagine being there. They were just trying to take in the fact that the baby's name would be John when suddenly Zachariah began talking again. And the words he spoke were blessings to God. Why would he bless God? Because he could talk again? I doubt it. I think he was blessing God because everything had come true so far. And because he believed that John would be the man who would go before the Messiah as promised by the angel. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. I'm sure that by the time John was born, all the neighbors knew about the miracle, granted to Elizabeth and to Zechariah. But when Zechariah suddenly spoke, they realized that this was the work of God. This was awesome, bordering on frightening. These events had happened before social media or telephones, but people talked about these things. And as John grew, they continued to see the signs that the hand of God was with him. And they wondered what would become of him. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. In verses 65 and 66, Luke had summed up the reaction of the relatives and neighbors right into the decades following these events. But in this verse, Luke took the readers back again to the scene where Zechariah had begun to speak again. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth had experienced that several months previously. Now it was Zechariah's turn. And he began to prophesy. He began by blessing or praising the Lord God of Israel. The God who gave Zechariah and Elizabeth a son, John, is the same God whose power came upon Mary. And we worship the very same God of the Old Testament. In verses 68 and 69, we have three action words about God's activity. He has visited, he has redeemed, and he has raised up. Now, I found it difficult to understand why they're not in the present tense, unless Zechariah was seeing into the future as if it had already happened. He was saying that God had visited his people after so many years of silence. Zechariah was not talking about his own son, John. At this point, he was talking about the Messiah, the one whom God had promised as far back as Eve. The idea of God visiting his people is frequent in Scripture. There is a sense of judgment that often comes with it. That is to say, God visits to judge his people. But here we find that God also visits to redeem his people. The idea of redeem is to buy them back, to restore them. Notice that the words redeemed and salvation don't tell us what they were redeemed from or tell us what they were saved from. This could refer to national or spiritual salvation. Well, we know that Jesus came for spiritual salvation, but that will become clear in later verses. So what is meant by God raised up a horn of salvation? When I was six, we stayed for a time with my mother's mother on her farm 
southeast of Uxbridge. My granddad had recently died and they were grieving and planning. My grandma couldn't manage the farm by herself. The work fell to my uncles and cousins. I remember going with them one day to see a big black bull, probably a Holstein, in a stall in the barn. And they impressed upon me how powerful and dangerous it was, and that the ring in its nose was there so it could be safely controlled. Later, when I was doing some studying of genealogy, I learned that my Grandpa Richardson's grandfather had died in his mid-forties, killed by a bull. Now, I mention these things because a bull is a powerful beast. Gelden Huys commented that the power is concentrated in its horn. So in biblical imagery, the word horn stands for power. We see in verse 69 that God has raised up a horn of salvation, a powerful man who would bring salvation. He would arise in the house of God's servant David. So this is a descendant of King David, someone of the royal line. Jesus came from the line of David. That horn of salvation is Jesus. Now all of this happened according to prophecy. The specific reference to the horn of the house of David is from Psalm 132, verse 17. But the fact is that the coming Messiah was predicted throughout Scripture, going back as far as God's promise to Eve in Genesis 3, 15, that her seed meaning the Messiah, would bruise the head of the serpent, that is, Satan. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham. Notice that the imagery here is like that of the Old Testament prophets. They saw salvation as being saved from their earthly enemies. And so the picture is of the Messiah conquering Israel's enemies. That's how they saw God's mercy being shown. And that's how they saw God keeping his promises. But that was a picture. In the New Testament, we learn that those promises are fulfilled in Jesus. They're not fulfilled by earthly conquest, or military salvation. And so I warn against another false teaching, that teaching that Christians are supposed to take over the government and bring about God's kingdom on earth through political or military power. When Jesus was on trial before Pilate, he denied that he had come to be an earthly king. In fact, in John 18, 36, he said that his kingdom was not of this world. There are several parts to God's promises to Abraham that we should think about. In Genesis 12:3, God promised that through him all the world would be blessed. In Genesis 15:5, God promised him many offspring. And in Genesis 22:18, God promised that the blessing would come through his offspring. And when we studied Galatians, we learned that Jesus was the offspring who would bring blessing on everyone. So God was remembering his covenant with Abraham by sending Jesus as the Messiah. To grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. In the expression to grant us, us refers to God's people, the Jews. So why did Luke, a Gentile, include this in his account of Jesus' life? Luke recognized what his colleague Paul taught so clearly, that all believers, whether Jew or Gentile, share in the blessings of the Messiah, the Christ. We just saw in Romans 
that Gentiles who believe in Jesus are grafted onto the tree that had its roots back in Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And Luke also knew that it was good for Gentile believers to understand that Christ's coming was prophesied in the Jewish scriptures, which we call the Old Testament. So studying the Old Testament is valuable, not just for Jewish believers, although with their background, they would be more likely to recognize the predictions of the Messiah more easily. In the expression to grant us, the word grant reminds us that what we have is a gift, not something that we have as a right. And what is it that we have been granted? We might think that we've been granted deliverance from the hand of our enemies, which are sin and Satan and his hosts, and we have been delivered. But what we've been granted, if you follow the paragraph, is that we might serve him. That's what we've been granted, to serve him. This is why we're saved, for the privilege of serving Jesus. It's a sad fact that there are those who want a Christianity that doesn't interfere with their lives. They want to be saved from hell, of course. But beyond that, they want as little to do with Jesus as possible. However, that kind of Christianity doesn't fit with verses 74 and 75. Yes, we have been delivered or saved from sin and Satan and their power over us. But what we are granted or given in the process is that we might serve him. And notice how we might serve him. First, without fear. We have been delivered from our enemies. We don't have to fear them or their power in our lives. And second, in holiness and in righteousness. That's how we serve God. Let's not for imagine that when we're involved in sin that we are serving God. We serve him in holy living, which means separate from the world and devoted to God. And we serve him in righteousness, which means doing what's right instead of doing what's sin. And third, we serve him all our days. This is our privilege. Occasionally, someone will convert to Jesus on their deathbed, much like the thief on the cross. That can happen. But normally, we hear and respond to God's call sometime during our lives. And for the rest of our days, it's granted to us to serve God without fear and in holiness and righteousness. Up to this point, Zechariah's prophecy was not about John the Baptist, but about Jesus. He is more important after all. But then Zechariah promised about his son John. He prophesied, rather, about his son John. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people, in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. The expression, the Most High, is an expression from the Old Testament and used frequently, even in the New Testament, to refer to God. So Zechariah was blessing his baby boy and telling those who were listening that the baby John would become a prophet of God. John's role as a prophet would be to go before the Lord. The Messiah was coming, God in human form, that is to say, Jesus. And John would go first to prepare the way for him. From Malachi 4 or 5, we saw that he would be like the prophet Elijah. And from Isaiah 40, verse 3, we saw that he would prepare the way of the Lord. John the Baptist would preach repentance so that people's hearts would be ready for the coming of Jesus. Part of John's role would be to give knowledge of salvation to his people. 
What did the Holy Spirit mean as he inspired Zechariah? Let me share with you several possibilities. John the Baptist was preparing the way for the Messiah. So it's possible that Zechariah was referring to the fact that it would be the Messiah who would bring salvation. And since John's preaching would focus on repentance, we understand that repentance is important to salvation. We should know already that coming to Jesus to be saved from sin inevitably regards our repentance from our sin. We cannot be saved from sin that we've not repented of. And it's also possible that through Zechariah, the Holy Spirit may have been referring to people's expectation for political salvation. And they needed to understand it was spiritual salvation. He needed to turn their expectation from military victory to victory over sin. After all, forgiveness of sins does not count as a political or military victory. Now whatever God, God the Spirit was referring to specifically, and it's quite possible he meant at least all of the above, John would increase people's knowledge of salvation and forgiveness as he pointed to Jesus. This expression, tender mercy, has the idea of the love a father has for his children. This is what God's mercy is like. Well, what do we mean by that? Those of us who've had good fathers know that they cared for us despite our weaknesses, and even despite the times that we were disobedient and disrespectful. And they treated us tenderly when we were injured or suffering. But what about the expression, the sunrise shall visit us from on high? In Malachi 4.2, just before promising the coming of Elijah, that is to say John the Baptist, Malachi prophesied that for those who feared God, the sun of righteousness would rise with healing in its wings. Now that's not an expression that means a great deal to us. But Zechariah used that idea when he prophesied that the sunrise shall visit us from on high. In other words, the sunrise would be a person coming from God. And that's a way of describing Jesus as the Messiah. To those who feared God already, Jesus would be like the sun, bringing warmth and growth and healing. To give light to those who sit in darkness, and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. The sunshine that Zechariah spoke of in verse 78 would give light to those who sit in darkness. Compare this to the prophecy given in Isaiah 9. In verse 2, Isaiah wrote that the people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. And then further down in chapter 9, in verses 6 and 7, Isaiah wrote these famous words that we hear every Christmas that, because they're about Jesus. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end, on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So even in his blessing on his son John, by the Holy Spirit, Zechariah was proclaiming that the Messiah would be the one who was predicted in Isaiah chapter 9. Let's look at this another way. First, Jesus brings, as uh, sunshine, brings light into the darkness. Light represents both truth and righteousness. In John 3.19, we read that people loved darkness rather than light because their works were evil. 
So there are some who avoid the light. But those who are of the light and who want the light, they want the truth and they want to live righteously. And Jesus is the sunrise who brings light to those who sit in darkness. And second, Jesus brings light to those who sit in the shadow of death. This is not the darkness of evil, but the darkness of death itself. And since Jesus is the one who rose from the dead, we no longer fear death. And finally, the light of Jesus guides our feet into the way of peace. Well, we know this is part of what light does. It illuminates our path so that we can see where we're going. And it's a path of peace. Peace with others, but mostly peace with God because we learn to walk in his ways, doing what is holy and righteous, and so serving him. Having finished telling us what Zechariah prophesied under the power of the Holy Spirit, Luke summarized the first 30 years of the life of John the Baptist in these few words. He grew, as children do. He became strong in spirit, meaning mentally, emotionally, and morally. And when he left home, he spent his life in the wilderness until it was time to appear in public as John the Baptist. Now, in a future study, we will learn more about John the Baptist and his ministry. But for now, I hope we are impressed with how God had planned the coming of the Messiah and John before him. Impressed in the sense that we recognize the love and care that God put into arranging the coming of John and then of Jesus. Let us pray. Our Father, you planned all this, and then you executed your plans for the purpose of saving us. Help us to understand the wonder of your love for us as sinful human beings. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.